Welcome to Redefining Medicine, an intimate and personalized program that illustrates a different side of the practice of medicine. Our in-depth conversations will focus on mentors and motivators who are consistently reshaping, redefining, and rediscovering the field of medical health care. I am thrilled to welcome back Silicon Valley investor, notable entrepreneur, author of four New York Times bestsellers, biohacker Dave Asprey. Welcome to Redefining Medicine. I am so thrilled to have back for the second time my friend Dave Asprey. If you don't know Dave, which I can't imagine anybody wouldn't know you. Still happens. Okay. <laughs> He's a Silicon Valley investor, founder of the incredible brand Bulletproof Coffee, and host of the super successful podcast and pro radio program and, and blog and everything, Bulletproof Radio. So thank you again for joining us, Dave. Oh, I'm happy to be here to support you and A4 and Monica. <laughs> well, you, uh, we had you on exactly two years ago, and you were our very first guest. What an honor. Well, it was an honor for me, and thank you for trusting me with your time and, and sharing your story. So for those that have not seen that video and don't know much about you, if you can give us the shorter version of how you found A4M and, and how you started biohacking your body and why. Uh, sure. I used to weigh 300 pounds. I had arthritis in my knees since I was 14. In my mid-20s, I was diagnosed with high risk of stroke and heart attack, chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, uh, pre-diabetes, and I had massive cognitive dysfunction uh, that was threatening my career, even though I was doing well in my career. When my regular, uh, say, non-integrative uh, uh, doctor told me that vitamin C would kill me and didn't know who Linus Pauling was, uh, who, if you're listening and you don't, that's okay, but he won two Nobel Prizes, only guy ever to do that, took 90 grams of vitamin C a day and helped explain why it worked. So I fired the doctor and I said, I'm a computer hacker in, in Silicon Valley, so I should be able to hack this because how hard could it be? And I started getting into nootropics and smart drugs and met the guy who ran the first newsletter on these back before we had email lists. And then I heard about the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine. And it was a guide from A4M and finding a good doctor that led me to a, a doctor who could help me figure out what's going on with myself. But when I walked into that doctor, I said, I have one of these seven conditions. In this order, I want these lab tests from these places. I want these treatment protocols. And I might have been a little bit, uh, well, cognitively dysfunctional uh, because that's what happens when you live with toxic mold. And you fast forward almost 20 years later, I spent $300,000 upgrading my biology when I started Bulletproof. And since then, I've spent a million dollars or thereabouts and 9.6% body fat. I've raised my IQ. Uh, I'm smarter, faster, <laughs> uh, happier, like everything you can do. Uh, that's possible. So I, I believe that there are many levels of human performance that are possible because I started so far in the basement. Uh, but I can tell you, I was learning this through running an anti-aging nonprofit group in Silicon Valley for almost 20 years. I'm fortunate I hooked up with people. I, I'm you know, my, my mid to late 20s and there's 88 year olds teaching me what they're doing that works. And it works for me too. And that kind of a perspective, just seeing what we can do, uh, led first to a little bit of anger, like why didn't someone tell me when I was 20? And then led me to say, I should write this blog. Bulletproof was not meant to be a company. <laughs> it was meant to be a blog to say, hey, uh, this is gonna change your life. You should read this because I already was a vice president at a big company and my job was to fly around to give keynote presentations about the future of cloud computing security. Not that exciting, but a pretty good job for a guy with two young kids. But when millions of people started going to the blog, I said, all right, what if I could make this coffee? What if I could use this form of MCT oil that no one else can make and I can figure this out. What if there was this new supplement? All the stuff I dreamed about, that was my hobby, that was my passion. I said, I'm just gonna make stuff I can't buy and maybe it'll stick, but the market size for every Bulletproof product was zero when we started or near zero. And coffee beans without mold, there was no market. Brain Octane oil, which is now the number one selling MCT oil by far because it's not just MCT oil. It, it, we take out the cheap MCTs, number one market share. And then you look at collagen protein. We were the company that put collagen on the market as this beauty and high performance thing. And now collagen's everywhere. But you look back in the day, it was the Bulletproof blog about collagen that started that revolution. And this whole Bulletproof coffee with butter and all, there's, I don't know, thousands of, of 
of companies you know, doing it, little coffee shops everywhere, but it created a movement globally. And they're doing it in Japan, they're doing it in Indonesia. And the idea here is, hey, a high fat diet with the right fats does something to your brain and your metabolism. And a high fat diet with the wrong fats does the opposite thing. So high fat diets are dumb, high protein diets are dumb unless you know what kind of protein, and high carb diets are dumb unless you know what kind of carbs. Because corn syrup and margarine does something very different than any other kind of carb, any other kind of fat. So it's just, we can dumb it down, but only so far. And when we said, people are smart, people want to feel good all the time, and there's ways to do that that are reliable and noticeable, I just, my bet was, you're smart enough to do that, you're going to do that because you like how you feel. And that's what led to Bulletproof. It seems to me, especially with the, you know, 20-something and 30-something generation, that you've helped create this revolution. I can speak personally, even for my own kids, because of the information that you disseminate, it's, and, it, and you do it in a way that, you know, is, you know, the layperson can actually understand and, and get it. It's one thing to hear from a physician, but oftentimes they have their ego involved and it's, they're using words that, that most people can't understand. So the fact that you've actually create this, you know, revolution for people to want to get healthy and really understand what it is, and it's not just about healthy, it's also about peak performance in their personal life and professional life. Yeah. So did you, when, if you think back on when you started your own personal journey of biohacking yourself, could you ever imagine that it would get to be this big? You know, when I, when I created the term biohacking, which it, it's awesome, it got added by Miriam Webster's to the list of new I words in the heard. English language. And right. so it's, it's now officially a thing. And there's hundreds of thousands of people who do it. And Did you know, they get I, the definition right, by the way? Their According definition to you. was a little bit more bland. It wasn't the one that, right. w that I originally published. But they found a usage from 1992 about hacking your cat or something. So it's been used in different ways. But in terms of this movement and building a community, it, it's a new thing. But you're asking me something else. I was asking you if you, if reflecting back to when you started so, doing it for yourself, yeah. could you imagine that no. you would have been able to help as many for, people as you for are? For me, look, I was desperate. I, I had made six million dollars when I was 26 years old. I, I was a co-founder of part of the company that held Google's first servers. So here it is. I'm fat. My brain doesn't work. I bought disability insurance because I was really worried. Like I, I can't remember things, and I, I'm super angry a lot, and my emotions are all over the place, and my knees hurt all the time, and. I feel like garbage when I wake up in the morning and I go to the doctor and they look at me and say, maybe you try to lose weight. And I'm like, I worked out an hour and a half a day, six days a week, I went on a low fat, low calorie diet, I was religious about it, and all I got was strong and I stayed fat and then I got tired and probably got Hashimoto's as a result of it, thanks guys. And like, like what you're telling me doesn't work and then the doctor looks at you and goes, mm. And you can tell, they think you're lying. Because in medical school, if, if someone has five symptoms, they're hypochondriac, right? Give them Prozac and get them out the door. Okay, I'm, I'm summarizing probably two years of education there, but it, a lot of doctors have told me. You can't have more than five symptoms, otherwise it's you. Well, if you have systemic poisoning from an environmental toxin, wouldn't it make sense that that would happen? So I went through that whole thing, and this was about survival and about this core desire to feel really good and just to not be fat, right? But it wasn't even about fat. I just wanted my brain feel to work. Fat. Yeah, that you want to wake up in the morning and feel like you have, uh, like if you press the accelerator, you'll go faster. I had it pinned to the floor and I was slowing down. And you were dieting and you were doing all the right things, yeah. so he well, thought. Right, and it was that, that just first, like, it's because I'm not doing it hard enough, I'm not trying hard enough, so then it's a moral failing. Mm -hmm. And today, there are many people who are dealing with chronic illness who don't know it's an illness and they just think it's them. And I, I just find that, that that experience made me it made me want to do this. And then when I said, all right, I'm going to do biohacking, I, I did a conference. It started with 100 people, and it was 3,000 people last year. The, the next one's in April 5th in LA. And what kind of people attend? Um, it's, it, there are just some overlap with A4M. Uh, probably, you know, I would be surprised if 10% of people were from A4M. But so they're physicians, or they're? Oh, no, it, okay. this is for biohackers. Right. So you do see a good number of physicians, and you see sports trainers, and you see Navy SEALs, and martial artists, and meditation masters, and yoga teachers, and just lots of people who are saying, you know, I want to be better at everything. And so they show up, and they get to interact. And it's a, it's a very different perspective. But some of the tech that, that I've added to the world of biohacking comes from the world of anti-aging medicine. Like, who are the people who first got red light therapy out the door. It was A4M people. And I, I've been using red light and lasers for 20 years on myself. And now it's become popularized. It was the cosmetic use here. So these things are making their way out of medicine into the hands of lay people and sports trainers and things like that. So I want, like, how do I accelerate that? How do I get 
all these crazy anti-aging people, how do I get them connected with young people? Because guess what? When you're young, you already know you're going to live forever. So you don't worry about it. What you worry about is reproducing. You're wired to do that. And I, I know you have a daughter in her 20s. I'm just not even going to say anything else. <laughs> <laughs> but I, seriously, this is what, what, what young people are supposed to care about if their hormones are working. Right? And it's normal and healthy. So you go to someone like that and you say, you know, you're going to be old someday. And they're like, yeah, right. Like, I'm going to live forever. Right? And then we flip it around. You get to when you're 50 and you say, God, those kids have a lot of energy and they're, they might take my job. And what's going on with this? I think I would like to remain competitive and keep up. And by the way, I don't really like how I look in the mirror. And I don't really like what's going on in the bedroom. And I'm losing a little bit of hair. And you start really getting interested in anti-aging. But if someone had told you the right words when you were 20, you wouldn't hit that when you were 50. You'd hit that when you were 70. And you just can't make younger people care unless you use language and things they care about. And the big revolution for biohacking and for Bulletproof was saying, hey, what would I have listened to when I was 20? Because no one went to the trouble of telling me what to do when I was 20. And there were people who knew what to do when I had all those problems. And I could not find the information. And if it was out there, I could not connect with it. So I said, I'm going to fix that. And if I do it for five people, that was my goal with the blog. It was just an act of service. For five people and change their lives the way it would be mine, I'm done. And how many subscribers do you have now? I think our email is like a million. And you and have like two million downloads a month or something on yeah, your for the podcast. podcast. It's crazy. It won a Webby Award. And uh, it's, you know, it's now you know, the subject of, of game changers, you know, using, right. the, using it as a study of what high performers do. Uh, and so I've learned this amazing amount. And the idea is I'm just going to share it. And we get about six million people between social media and the blog and all that. So the idea is to be one of the leading voices, not really in health, I'm not that interested in, in health. Yeah, <laughs> You're a life coach. Well, it, it's life. And, and also, right. it, do you ever wake up in the morning and go, wow, today I want to be healthy? Like, it's the most weaselly, weak thing you could ever say. Like, how about this? I'd like to be, a, I'd like to kick ass. I'd like to be abundantly healthy. Like, I want to be more than enough, right? If you could ask for anything you want, is healthy really what you want? Healthy is what you're supposed to be. It's table stakes. It's average. Maybe it's not average anymore. But people don't wake up in the morning going, God, yeah, I'm going to be healthy. And when you're older, you, you might wake up saying, I want to be young again, but when you're young, you'll never say that. So I knew that my life was changed by the anti-aging movement because I was old when I was young. I had all the diseases of aging before I was 30. But most 20, 30-year-olds who are going to get those will not connect until they get them. So what if we turned it around and we used language and we used topics that would connect earlier? And that's life-changing. And you see it because you don't know you have a little bit of brain fog in your 20s because you have enough energy. You just kind of work around it. And by the time it's bad enough that you notice, you've taken 10, 15 years of damage. So have you tested your biological age now? Do you know what you are? It, well, it depends. I mean, there's so many different ways of looking at it. Uh, we just launched a new uh, mitochondrial uh, performance test to look at what your uh, mitochondrial performance looks like from an age perspective. And in uh, my last book, uh, Before Game Changers, uh, the one I think last year I, I presented on it, it's called Headstrong, I talked about how 48% of people under age 40 have early onset mitochondrial dysfunction. But everyone over age 40 has mitochondrial dysfunction. They just call it aging. So we're getting to the point where we can test mitochondrial sufficiency. And we just got the gear in. So I'm going to go do that test pretty soon. I have tested my telomeres. The problem is that. There's a very high variance in blood telomeres, so I'm actually going out to get um, other types of tissues tested because I've seen when I do tests back to back, a uh, 15 year swing. Wow. <laughs> so I'm not quite sure that I'm going to rely on those tests until I've gotten a little bit more data. So we'll, we're finding every day more ways to correlate things. You can also look at things like hippocampal volume. And I just had mine done. I'm in the 87th percentile um, of size, which means my brain isn't shrinking the way it's supposed to shrink when you age. How did you test it before? I know you had done the spec scan with Dr. Amen. Uh, they don't do hippocampal volume no, in a spec you, scan. Have you checked? I don't have what like your a 20 year MRIs or anything to basically see what your um, how if any atrophy at all. Uh, well, I don't have MRIs from you know, 20 years ago, partly because right. well, they were much more expensive, and, right. and I wouldn't really get a brain MRI uh, back then. Uh, I do have the old spec scans and the new spec scans, and those are radically different from Daniel Amen. 
And it was Eamon's book on scanning the brain that really kind of got me going. It was one of several things, but it really helped me on the biohacking front. Oh, I've got a hardware problem. I can hack that. But if you have a moral failing, and aging is quite often, aging and obesity are quite often seen as moral failings, and they're not, but people see them as like, they're just hardware issues that you can deal with. So the spec scan, I went from uh, this quote, I'll never forget it, because it was kind of scary. I was going to Wharton Business School while working full time. I went to this executive program where they fly the professors out and it was super high intensity. And I was just a zombie. I, my brain was, was fried. I, I could barely pay attention. And I didn't know I was dealing with toxic mold in my house and that I was recovering from a bunch of stuff. And I, I went to get my, uh, my spec scan and you could tell the psychiatrist believed that I was trying to hit him up for Adderall because that's what you know Silicon Valley Business School students would do. And I actually wanted modafinil, <laughs> not Adderall. I did my research, and Adderall doesn't sound like a good drug, but, but modafinil, that's a good smart drug. And when I came back with the results, his, he just looked at the results and he looked at me and he said, he said, Dave, inside your brain is total chaos. I don't know how you're standing here in front of me. You have the best camouflage I've ever seen. And when he saw my brain, he's like, I don't know how you're putting one foot in front of the other, but you're showing up in my office, you're saying the right things, but you should, basically your eyes should be crossing, you should be drooling. And when uh, Daniel Amen looked at the scan uh, personally a, a couple of years later, he said, Dave, if I didn't know this was you, I'd say, this is the, the brain of someone living under a bridge, wow. like, like doing street drugs. I had chemical induced brain damage from my environment and probably from my food. And to reverse that into what I have now, which is a brain that's perfectly even with no scalloping. So that definitely is working, but can I say that that's a younger brain or just a higher functioning brain? Heck, I don't know. Have you personally done any research as to, statistically speaking, how many people you think are walking around with major mycotoxin and mold, you know, yeah. poisoning? I, I think that mold poisoning in our buildings is, uh, it, it's almost unconceivably large. I shot a documentary, it's called Moldy the Movie, and I paid for it out of my own pocket at moldymovie.com. It's, it's on free screening, you just go there and in your email and I just let you watch this thing. And I interviewed a dozen uh, people. You hear from Dr. Mark Hyman, uh, Daniel Amen, and uh, a ton of about 10 other physicians who are experts in the field talking about what mold does. And since then, people I've interviewed on Bulletproof Radio have, have made very clear connections between mold and Alzheimer's disease. And we're talking about environmental mold that you breathe. So uh, I've, I interviewed people about building structures, people do remediation, and the, the good estimate is about 100 million structures in the US have toxic mold problems, from leaks, from bad roofs, from humidity, like what, 100 million places? And somewhere between 22 and 28% of people have genes that cause them to be permanently inflamed until they get turned off. And uh, here at uh, A4M, I just interviewed uh, Andy Heyman, who uh, is, is really, really working on the genomic differences of people who've been exposed to mold. When I started doing this, people would say, oh, you're just sensitive and you're being a wuss. It's like, no, this stuff completely makes you act like a jerk and makes you zombified and you can gain 30 pounds in a month no matter what you eat. And you don't have to be exposed to it daily for, no. for a year. It could just be a short term thing. It can be two days, wrong right. species, and all of a sudden just nothing's right and you get sinus infections like I had all the time. And so it's basically kryptonite studded around the population. You don't know if you're going to be excessively uh, symptomatic like I am, but for everyone else, it raises risk of cancer, stroke, heart attacks, diabetes, asthma, like all the bad stuff, and we can fix it. So I, I thought this was a, a very, very important point, and it's one of the reasons I take the mold out of the Bulletproof coffee beans, because mold in our food is another major issue. Um, it's less of an issue in terms of, of impact on us, because at least when you eat something, some of your gastric juices might turn off some of the toxins, but when you breathe it, it just goes into your brain. Uh, so I, I think we're right on the cusp of that becoming a major, major topic, way worse than asbestos, uh, and one of those things where you can't stop it. Part of my personal mission here is to do things that are game changers, things that, that don't just move the needle a little bit, it has to change everything. So one of the companies that I started is called Homebiotic. And this is a probiotic spray that you spray it around your house. And these bacteria eat 
Mold, we'll call, call them tendrils or roots, they're called hyphae. It eats those when they come out. Mold cannot reproduce when this is there. And this it's, is, it's commercialized already? Yeah, it's called home biotic. And I've been working on this for four years, wow. and I barely talk about it. But now I take that stuff, I spray it around my house. I live in the Pacific Northwest. Please, my you house can spray it in a mold. hotel. Oh, yeah, I do, every time <laughs> I travel. I've been suffocating yeah, since I got here. This hotel has issues with mold, like, right. especially in the hallways, because they're saying we're, we're environmentally conscious. It means they turn off the, the dehumidifiers in the hallways, so they smell like mops. That's not good for us. So I, I want to build buildings that make people live longer. That's part of the anti-aging movement. Our environment controls us. How about we don't save a nickel on our electricity? How about we have great lighting, great air, great water, and we save as much electricity after we do that? And it's the same with food. It's the same with supplements. Get out the bad crap, do the highest quality that's reasonably affordable, uh, and it's okay to spend a little bit more because their quality of life is so much better. So when you travel, and I know you travel a lot, do you take any preventative measures when you go, you know, when you're spending four days in a hotel? Oh, I do crazy stuff. I travel a good 150 days of the right. year. Oh, and it's got to be so hard on your body. It's terrible from an anti-aging perspective. Right. So, I mean, I was in Arkansas five days ago, or Dallas five days ago, Arkansas eight days ago, uh, 10 days before that I was in New York. So I'm going back and forth across the country. I live on the West Coast, so it's like boing, boing, boing. And number one, you gotta protect yourself from jet lag. And uh, one of my other portfolio companies, uh, besides Bulletproof, TrueDark. You didn't have all these companies two years ago, by the way. Oh, I, I did, I just, uh, you know. You didn't talk about them. No, but, but I've, most of these I started uh, you know, four plus okay. years ago. But to do TrueDark, we have a patent on a set of optical filters that, according to what we're seeing, stops jet lag when people use them properly, right? And it's, it, it's pretty amazing stuff. I've found that if I, I'm using an Aura ring, I can double my deep sleep if I wear funky looking glasses, not these ones, it's a different model from, from True Dark. But if I wear those when I go to New York, the last time I went, I landed at midnight, I slept eight hours without waking up, and fe woke up feeling normal at what would have been 5 a.m. my time, hopped in a car, went on the Dr. Oz show, hopped on a plane and flew home. Okay. You don't do that normally. You wake up feeling like a zombie. You stumble around, have two cups of coffee, and you sort of put on some makeup. But to sleep the whole night, I've never done that in my entire career. But to be able to control light exposure like that, it matters. So I, I, I'm basically looking to say, all right, what really moves the needle? It turns out light exposure matters. Toxin exposure in your home, in your school, in your car, wherever, that really matters. But most of all, it's the food. In fact, game changers. I interviewed... 450 people for this book on Bulletproof Radio. I asked every one of them. These are people who've created new fields of medicine. Mm -hmm. Guys like uh, Dr. Pizzorno, uh, Stan Groff, the first psychiatrist to study what LSD did in a clinical setting that led to the, the psychedelic renaissance we have today. I mean, people have done really big things. David Perlmutter, Daniel Amen, and a bunch of people who are not doctors, uh, who have just done, had really big effects on the world. People who are game changers. Naveen Jain. Oh, Naveen Jain, of course. <laughs> uh, Naveen is... Uh, I love him. He's here. He's, he's a dear friend. I know. He was friend. here. He sat in that chair two okay, days ago. beautiful. Uh, and he's been on my show, I think, four times. And I ended up becoming a very early stage advisor to Viome and an investor. And he's been an investor in Bulletproof and a very good mentor for me on just how businesses work. And... Uh, in fact, Viome is one of those things that has me most excited. I am so excited about that as well. The technology there is legit. But I asked everyone's people, Tell me three pieces of advice you have for someone who wants to perform better as a human being. I didn't say someone who wants anti-aging. I didn't say someone you know, who wants to have abs, <laughs> right? Uh, and, and I didn't say someone who wants to be healthy. So you want to perform better at everything you do. Because that means if you want to be better at being a parent or at being a pianist or being a teacher or a community member or an entrepreneur or a doctor or whatever you want to do. I believe that we or all... Or a biohacker. Yeah. We all want to do what we, what we love with excellence. No one wants to do a crappy job. It doesn't feel good to do a crappy job. So I asked him this, and then I worked with a statistician to cluster the responses and measure them. And that word map that I just showed was of all these people, including Nobel Prize winners, guys like Eric Handel, uh, you know, who basically discovered neuroplasticity and is still working at 94 years old in his lab in New York City. Like, like really impressive people. I wanted to learn from them. But number one thing they said mattered, food. So even if they're not working in our field, they said, you know, I noticed that I can't do what, I, what I'm supposed to do if I eat garbage. So I, I've learned over the years that I should do this. And what people clustered into were these big three buckets. They do things to be smarter, they do things to be faster, and they do things to be happier, right? And when you look at the, the set of aging, right, when you get older, 
you're not as fast as you were and frankly not as smart as you were. You're, you have more wisdom, but your reaction speed, your working memory, those tend to go down, right? And happier, well, you can be happy when you're older. A lot of people have finally achieved that because they work through all the crap you know, that, that happens when you're but young. But their short-term memory is not working, so they forget what just happened. Yeah, and <laughs> I mean, we've all seen Grumpy Old Man in the movie, right? Right. Testosterone deficiency syndrome hits you, whether you're a man or a woman, and you're probably gonna be cranky too, like your happiness goes down. So I would posit that the things that game changers are doing are the things that maintain youthfulness, even as they age. And the people who do it when they're younger maintain vim and vigor, <laughs> or whatever you want to call it, that, that spark that lets them say, you know what, I'm going to do something noteworthy, something really big, something that I care deeply about. And there's a lot of difficulty in figuring out how do you do that. So in the past, what we would do is we'd say, well, that one guru did this, so I'm going to go do what they do. But I got news for you. I'm 6'4", I used to weigh 300 pounds, I have a history of autoimmunity, uh, and I'm a professional biohacker. If you take my stack of 150 supplements, you're probably gonna get disaster pants and a headache, right? Because it's tuned for my biology, right? And you may ha weigh half what I weigh, you may have different genetics, you have different parents, different lifestyle, you don't fly all over the place like I do. All that stuff, so it's, it's customized. So I don't want people to do what I do, even, even for any of this stuff, but when you realize 450 experts from diverse fields do these things, that's a scientific approach to doing better at everything. And it boiled down to 46 laws. And I call it, you know, laws for high performance or laws to, to change your game. And you your go first law is actually my my favorite oh, one. The power of no. <laughs> and and some of this is hardcore stuff around sleep. And it turns out angling the height of your bed uh, really can change potentially Alzheimer's outcomes and blood pressure issues. And I'm well known for writing about sleep hacks. Anytime you see a blog out there that says, oh, have collagen before bed or black out your room, those are original Bulletproof blogs that have been like echoed around the internet for eight years now. And great, everyone share that information. It's really important. Which by the way, I was very upset because my hotel room, you yeah. couldn't shut the blackout shade. Oh yeah. It, show, it closes like half the way and that was it. So all the Las Vegas strip lights are coming through the window. So oh, and I, I that and too. I, Did and you walk I over and just pull on it? No, it doesn't come. Oh, my it doesn't goodness. close. All right, can I give you a, like a free hack for that? Yeah. This is what I do. You, in fact, I prep my hotel rooms all the time like this. Go into the closet and get the little clothes hanger with the, the pincher clips for pants and go over to the curtains and use that to, as the yeah, clip. Yeah, but there's five or six feet in between uh, the two sides. That's not going to work. You no. need spray paint for that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I travel with electrical tape. I have these little dots that True Dark makes, and uh, uh, they're for covering LEDs. So, so I, you go around the room and you uh, totally. put them in front. Totally, yeah. Wow. I mean, if you're sleeping with a green blinking right, LED the... uh, on your smoke detector, you will not sleep well at all because green disrupts your circadian rhythm. And when it blinks every night, you'll wake up feeling stupid in the morning. And it's not you, it's, it's the environment. And it doesn't take very much light. And there are studies on this. It well, you presented today. Box. Yeah, that's what that, I talked right. about. The, so actually, you should touch on that. The... Sure. Well, I, I wanted, uh, last year at A4M, I talked really deeply about mitochondrial biology. And Headstrong hit the New York Times science list between Homo Deus and the hidden life of trees and all that. I'm like, oh my God, that's like the coolest thing that ever happened. Uh, and so I went really deep on that with uh, the physicians here and talked about toxins and talked about amplification of energy. But the one thing that's missing today is stuff that I started doing 20 years ago uh, around light. Uh, 20 years ago, I had this little device that was made after the first study showed that uh, infrared light affected brains of mice. So this crazy guy made an infrared device for 150 bucks sold on Yahoo Groups. It came in a little pill bottle, it was Dremel tooled out, and you put it on your brain to increase blood flow. And the warning was, don't do it for more than two minutes. So I would do this, and it totally helped my brain recover, probably from toxic mold, inflammation, eating bad stuff, whatever. But it was so noticeable, this was like my most precious piece of gear. Okay, we have 5.3 million people with traumatic brain injuries walking around right now who would benefit from this kind of tech. It was super airy-fairy back then, but it was very noticeably effective. Now there's enough science, but I feel like in the field of anti-aging medicine, when you say, wait a minute, you mean uh, you, can, you can have a 40% reduction in risk of breast cancer by turning the lights down at night? That is not a small effect. In fact, that dwarfs a lot of the other things we're doing to reduce risk. Maybe as a clinician, your job is to say, you know what, here's what to do with a $13 bulb. Uh, here's what to do with a dimmer switch because these environmental things are cheap and because I'm a trusted physician and because I'm, I have your back, I'm not gonna sell you a dimmer switch. I'm just gonna tell you how important this is and you're gonna come back to me because now you trust me because I gave you something that was important. And of course you're gonna do your testosterone therapy and all that, but if I miss that, I'm not doing my job as a doctor. So this is about becoming a trusted advocate and to get 
compliance from your patients. People who have proper lighting have less sugar cravings. Like that's important. If we all know that, like all right, instead of telling you to be a good patient and use your willpower, what if we just made it so you needed less willpower to do it? So I wanted to share that and I went through a bunch of science around stuff people don't know about lighting. So give us the pros and cons of the blue and, and red lighting. Sure. It turns out that blue light is normal. You go outside, there's a blue sky. But when you're outside, you also get the entire color of the rainbow, including red light, orange light, you know, all that stuff, and infrared light. And blue light is particularly stressful for your uh, retina and for your cornea and even for your skin. And it cr increases reactive oxygen species. It, uh, in fact, I showed some pictures of the corneal, the outer corneal layer from rats who lived for 30 days under moderate intensity light. And the ones under blue light had completely just decimated cornea. You can see the damage that's happening. And the white LED lights and the lights on your screens, those are that color blue light. So you want to get most of the blue out. But if you have no blue light during the day, blue is a signal to your brain that says, hey, wake up, it's daytime. So if you wear blue blocking glasses, you're not going to like what happens over time because you'll disrupt your circadian rhythm. So the glasses I'm wearing right now, these are the True Dark Twilight, or sorry, the True Dark Daywalker glasses are called. They block a little more than half of the blue light. So some gets through, but since we're under bright LED lights right now, if you do this all day, you know what I'm talking about, your brain feels like you have a pressure on your head right now and you get a little bit tired and kind of a little bit woozy. I just thought it was because I didn't have my bulletproof cough. Well, today. it's probably that. <laughs> but it's not just you. I, I mean, I've been on set on uh, Legends of Tomorrow, mm -hmm. uh, a superhero show with Brandon Routh, uh, who played Superman and is the Adam now and, and is a good friend. And I talked to all the cast and, and, and the crew, and you know what? They're all dealing with this. It, it, this bright lights, it makes them tired. Like, I don't remember my lights, and like, oh. So, this sort of thing, it, it's common in office workers. I had a, a fan on the Bulletproof page, he goes, Dave, every day at five o'clock, I'm so tired, I have these food cravings, but on weekends it doesn't happen. I wake up at the same time, I eat the same things, I couldn't figure it out. He said, I finally read the blog, it's about the lighting at work. So I put on a hat, I put on glasses, turned on my monitor, and I don't have food cravings during the week anymore. So I wanted people to hear that about blue light. So minimize it, and at night you gotta have none. And then red light actually has all kinds of beneficial effects. So one thing that people listening can do right now that totally changes things, go to Amazon, buy a red LED light. It doesn't have to be expensive or fancy, just a LED red. It could be little tape lights from a dance club, or it could be a little bulb, whatever. Put it behind your monitor and turn your monitor brightness down. And what you're doing is you're changing the percentage of red and blue light in the environment around you. And the red light makes you feel better and your brain relaxes and it totally works. And I wanted people to hear about that because the differences are noticeable. And what about for us crazies who sleep with the phone next to the bed? If you sleep with the phone next to the bed, you are not going to like what happens unless you put it in airplane mode. And sleeping with the phone off of airplane mode is bad for you on multiple, multiple reasons. The biggest one has to do with the voltage-gated calcium channel in cell membranes. And this is something most people haven't heard of. And you get these 1980s radio engineering guys who aren't bioengineers who say, there is no evidence that electromagnetic frequencies can affect things because they don't cook them. Now, the assumption there is that only cooking, or cooking is the only source of damage. What we know now is that the voltage-gated calcium channel is 17 million times more sensitive to voltage changes on the, on the membrane of the cell, which is caused by EMFs. And when that happens, you get a calcium influx, which causes cell swelling, which causes mitochondrial decline. So here's the deal, EMFs are bad for you. Guess what? I have a cell phone. The benefit I get from the cell phone exceeds the damage, but what I don't do, I don't keep the cell phone next to my junk because we know that it reduces your testosterone substantially and do that. And We know that. Mm -hmm. When I've asked urologists this, mm -hmm. they dispute that. They well, say there's no evidence about it. Well, it's funny that the way you say there's no evidence is you just ignore the evidence you don't like. But, but I not. have a friend who, in 26 years old, was diagnosed with testic I can't even say with testicular it. cancer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, here's the deal: it's probably related to testicular or, and other kinds of cancer because there is data. In fact, there's a lot of studies about that. And to say there's no data is ridiculous. You can say I don't believe the data out there because A, B, and C. But to say there's none, it means that you're willfully blind. Uh, and the other thing is effect size. How much? I took my phone and said, based on this, I don't think it's a good idea to put it near my liver or near uh, my testes. 
because the decline in testosterone is real and it's repeatable. You can measure this yourself. It's not that hard to give yourself 30 days. So I put my phone on my femur. I have pants with a pocket there and I always keep it on my right femur. Did a high density DEXA scan, 10% less bone density on my right femur than elsewhere in my body. Oh, wow. So now I have a little EMF fabric sewn into my pants and this is crazy. I put my phone in airplane mode when I don't need it and I don't keep it on my person. So all of your pants have all of my normal pants I wear, I'm wearing jeans today, they don't have that, but 90% of the time I'm wearing pants that have a little pocket down here. Wow. And partly it's because I travel extensively, I get enough EMFs and hotel rooms and things like that. But here's the deal, you could be alarmist and go, we live in a blue lit microwave world with radiation and we're all gonna die. And that kind of stress from that is gonna be more of an aging factor than anything else. Look, we live in an amazing world full of abundance, you can you can learn more from this phone than the king of the most powerful country on earth could do 100 or 50 years ago. I mean, literally, you have everything. That is precious. And you have the ability to control the environment around you more than we ever have before. So you can look at it with a glass half empty or glass half full. You can create social change in eight years. You can build biohacking in actually a little bit less than eight years. Uh, you can take a technology that would have taken two lifetimes to happen 50 years ago and you can make it happen in five years and it's only accelerating so i'm super excited about about all that stuff and emfs yeah they're not very good for you so put it on uh put it on airplane mode and don't sleep with it turned on and dim the screen at night and that's all you need to do but, in fact you want one more trick about the phone sure all right check this out i'm going to turn my phone around so you guys can see what's going on here all right uh and first can you focus on my phone okay this is my my bright screen here. And there's a text about anti-aging mechanisms about wavelengths of light. You gotta, gotta love it. So here's what I normally do. I keep my phone on night shift, the stuff that they make for nighttime. So during the day, my phone is more amber than normal. And this means I get less stress on my eyes when I look at my phone. But what I do that's way cooler than that, you can set up the, the visual assistance things. If you triple click on the thing on the right, I can reduce the white point and the phone suddenly gets dimmer. And if I triple click it again, I can put on the red filter. So when I use my phone at night, I have a dim red phone that doesn't mess up my eyes and my brain. And I put it on airplane mode. And if I wake up to check the alarm, I also black. Have, yeah, <laughs> and I have 2,000, oh, it black. I have 2,000 days of sleep data on my phone because the microphone can really do a good job of tracking your sleep. I slept six hours and six minutes per night on average for the last 2,000 nights. So That's remarkable considering all of your traveling and everything. Oh yeah, well it also means that, oh can we talk about sleep for a minute? Yeah. This Please. is in here. I like some right now. <laughs> it's, that's just the lighting. Right. Get you a pair of glasses, you'll be fine. Um, in Game Changers, sleep is one of the things that really came to the top of the list from the people I interviewed. And sleep effectiveness and efficiency is much more important than sleep duration. When I started the Bulletproof blog, I wrote about this study that no one covered. 1.2 million people, three years, more data points than any other sleep study ever made. And they found that the people who slept six and a half hours per night lived longer than people who slept eight hours a night. And people who slept nine hours a night died more than people who slept seven hours a night. What about those who sleep four? Well, those who sleep four had higher risk than people who slept six and a half, but not that much higher compared to people, in fact, they're probably on par with people who slept 10. So it turns out, oversleeping is at least as bad as undersleeping. And I did when I started Bulletproof. I went for between four and five hours, never more than five hours on purpose. I was gonna do it for a month just to see if I could make myself set up for obesity, gain a couple pounds, but I was gonna show calories in, calories out, didn't work. I'm like, wait, I feel great because I went Bulletproof at the same time. And so I ended up writing the first book, doing the blog, launching the company while I worked full time on four hours of sleep and probably didn't do good things for my telomeres. Uh, <laughs> it's not a good anti-aging strategy, but what emerged from that is that healthy people need less sleep. So don't restrict your sleep on purpose, but if you wake up full of energy in six and a half hours, you're doing it right. And if you need eight hours to do that, maybe you're over-exercising, <laughs> maybe you're eating the bad stuff, or maybe something else is going on. But if we realize sleep effectiveness matters more than sleep duration, it's really liberating. So I got a great night's sleep in less time, you win. And what is the effect on the brain? Of sleep? Mm -hmm. 
in Headstrong, my last book, I read about the glymphatic system. It had just been discovered at the time. You know, people hadn't really talked about it as much as they do now. This is the system that pumps cerebral spinal fluid in and out of the brain. So when you get a decent night's sleep, all of the cells in your brain dump their intercellular fluids, and then the toxic proteins that build up during the day get washed out through the lymphatic or the glymphatic system in the brain, and then they get replaced with fresh cerebral spinal fluid. So what are the variables you could control there? It turns out, and I found the studies, it was hard to find them, that system is controlled by mitochondria. So if you can upregulate mitochondrial function, I actually taught people, take unfair advantage, take keto prime, these are the supplements I make for mitochondria. Try that before bed and see what happens. And magically, if your mitochondria work better, they do a better job of pumping stuff in and out of the brain. Your body has more energy to fold proteins and do the stuff it does at night. So you can increase sleep efficiency by having younger acting mitochondria, which is pretty cool. You can also help, what if your cerebral spinal fluid was cleaner? Maybe some activated charcoal, probably the world's oldest anti-aging substance. And activated charcoal really does have great, like I think it's 15% longer life in mice and rats who just get charcoal in their food. Like seriously, that's more effective than some of the pharmaceuticals. And it's dirt cheap. Anyway, you could take some of that. And what's it gonna do? It's gonna reduce the toxic load. So maybe you need less brainwashing in your glymphatic system. But those are the kind of sleep hacks. You're saying, we know the mechanism, why don't you try it? And if you get data from your monitoring system that says, oh, you, you slept better and I felt better and I looked better, and it cost me you know, 10 bucks, I think I'm gonna do it. Let's shift gears a little bit and talk about the book. All right. So you have had how many how many episodes of your podcast have you done? Four hundred right. and something. Oh, when I when I stopped the data analysis for the book, just so I could put a kind of put a fork in it, we did four hundred and fifty episodes. I'm at five hundred and fifty, maybe five hundred and sixty episodes now. So that's more than three months of working eight hours a day just recording the episode, not to count all the research that goes into this. So this is a big labor of love for me. When you were trying to narrow down who you wanted to feature in your book. Mm -hmm. Who are the bigger, I mean, you have a huge network of people that are game changers in your life that you seek mentorship from, yeah. from I'm sure. Oh, yeah. So especially, you know, when, when you were first getting started. But how did you possibly narrow that down to, you know, see who you were going to include in your book? What I did is I looked at the entire data set mm -hmm. from everyone who's been on Bulletproof Radio. And I invite people who I really wanted to learn something from, people who've done something noteworthy or, or game changing. So maybe they wrote a, a book that talked about something no one's heard of, or they, they did something really impactful and different. So it, it's less interesting to say, oh, you're a celebrity? Okay, if you're a celebrity, great, there's lots of celebrities. What I want to know is, are you a celebrity who does something different? Do you have a breathing practice you do before you go on stage to sing to 100,000 people? If so I'm gonna talk about that, but the fact that you go on stage, great, right? But you're not the only one, there's like a lot of you out there, right? <laughs> so it, it, that's the difference. It's like, what are you doing that, that's, that's focused and intentional and different and noteworthy? That can teach me something. Yeah, and teach the audience mm -hmm. something. So all of the people's data is in here. And when I went through with the statistician and we, we teased out these 46 laws, then I said, all right, who has the stories that best illustrate these laws? And, I, and then I included those stories. So there's probably about 100 people whose stories are woven into this, along with mine. It, it would have been so relaxing to simply say, I'm going to pick 100 of my top episodes. I'm going to summarize each episode in a chapter of the book, and then I'm going to pump it out. It's very easy to write books that way. The problem is that there's no narrative, and it, it isn't saying... Purposeful. It isn't purposeful. Yeah. And the idea behind Game Changers was... Look, I found the principles, and I told you three or four reasons to do the principles. And I learned this from Robert Greene, who I interviewed here. This is a guy who wrote 48 Laws of Power, uh, which is a fantastic book. And he just wrote something like the 48 Laws of Human Nature that just came out. And one of my favorite authors, just he, he goes so deep, and he distills a principle and then illustrates it with stories from various places. I wanted to do that for how do we be better at everything. And the idea was get the principles, find the people who best explain them or demonstrate them in their life, and then talk about how they applied to me. Or sometimes they didn't. I mean, there's stuff in here about emotional eating or about the effects of orgasms on women. So I can say I like being a part of creating orgasms in women, but I've, you know, I, I can look at some science. What chapter is that? Um, I, it's, 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 it's <laughs> one of, these are around being happier chapter. I missed that one. <laughs> there, there actually is a law. There's three laws, about, four laws about sex in here, believe it or not. I interviewed John Gray, um, who, author of Mars and Venus, um, who's a personal friend, and, and several other people. I think Bruce Lipton might be in there as well, uh, kind of the father of epigenetics. 
And we're talking about, okay, this is what sex does to men. This is what sex does to women. And here's where it can hijack your brain. And lo and behold, it turns out, you know, martial artists and Olympic champions and people like that, they actually pay attention to that. And the happiest people, the highest performing people, uh, Dr. Paul Zak, I'm talking about oxytocin. Look, it has different effects on men and women. And if you don't talk about that in the context of high performance, there's really only three things that the cells in your body are desperate to do. Number one, not die right now, so run away from a kill from, or kill scary things. Number two, don't starve, so eat everything. Number three, have sex with everything else. Okay, that's what makes bacteria alive, that's what makes humans and dogs and whales and cats. Die happy. Yeah, I mean, that, that we're wired to do those things, right? right? Well, if you, if you say, okay, I got rid of my fear, I dealt with my stress response, and I went into ketosis every now and then, I got rid of my hunger response, and you walk around with no love in your life, your body's like, the species will die, don't you know? Like, you have to reproduce. Whether or not you actually reproduce is different, but you need to at least go through the experience of, of, of having sex. And the people who perform all do that. It's part of anti-aging. It's very important. But it, we just go tee-hee, and we don't talk about it. So right now, there's four of the 46 laws that are about sex. you got to read it. So not necessarily the sex ones, unless they're part of my next question or your answer to this question. But pick your top three laws. Uh, wow. Top three out of all this? Um, one of them is about the power of no. It's the first law in the book. And it sounds kind of obvious, but the subtext for it, each law is, is it's you know, three or four words, and then a one paragraph descriptor of the law. And it's that you don't say no necessarily to things you don't like, but you say no to things that suck your energy so that you can make time and more importantly, make energy for the things that really matter. And this is something that especially entrepreneurs are terrible at. And a lot of, in fact, almost every doctor now, unless you work for a hospital, you're an entrepreneur, you have your own practice, right? Well, when that happens, it, you don't get a lot of business training when you're in medical school, right? So all of a sudden, you don't get a lot of entrepreneur training in most schools. So all of a sudden, you're, you're now there saying, oh, there's all these opportunities. I, I gotta say yes to this, I gotta say yes to this, I gotta say yes to all my employees, even if they're asking me to do their job for them, which is very common when you're a CEO. What should I do? Like, and I paid you to know what to do. Like, like could you figure it out and come back with three, uh, three ideas if you need help, and then I'll work it through? That's effective leadership, but most of the time we say, we'll just make the decision for you. So focusing on the power of no, game changers realize, look, that takes my energy. I could do it. I'm just not going to. I'm going to save that precious energy, and I'm going to use it on something that matters. And it's a different mindset than just avoiding what you don't like. It's not just an emotional energy. It's actually a physical energy. Well, emotional energy still takes electrons. Yeah. So emotional energy and physical energy are the same. So if you really resist something, either you have a trauma about it, you need to go deal with some trauma, do some some therapy on it, uh, do some EMDR or whatever. But um, quite often, you're just not good at it, right? So I am built, I've looked at my genetics, I can sprint and I can pick up heavy things, but I'm not a long distance runner. So I can say I'm weak at long distance running and I don't like it, it, it actually sucks. <laughs> so I could make myself do it because I'm weak at it and, and it would take a huge amount of energy and I'd always be below average and I'd never like it. Or I could say, you know what, I'll have someone else run for me, I'll do some sprints, right? And I could focus on things that give me the highest return. So the people say no to things that are low return is what it comes down to. I mean, when I read it, to me it looked like it was, for me personally, I equated it to relationships oh, and yeah. friendships and whether it's professional or personal and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And it was like sometimes that phone rings and you're like, oh no. And you press decline because yeah. you just didn't want it because it sucks so much mm -hmm. energy out of you. So for me, that's my favorite my favorite law, but so give me your other two. You know, one of the other ones is around the power of community, and I want to quote the exact law here, but it might take me a minute to flip to that page. So what came out of this is that having a strong community was something that people who have a big impact do. And they don't just have the community that's around them, they create the community around them. And I realized having uh, talked to those people, looked at the research, uh, this is what I did with biohacking. And there was no community for this. I, I wanted some excuse for bodybuilders, anti-aging physicians, neurologists, and Navy SEALs to all hang out together, some Olympic athletes, toss them in there, and figure out what the heck we're doing that we never talk about. So building community, though, really, really matters. And so people elucidate that. And a couple of things came out of that in different laws. One is you have a, a community of people um, who are supportive for what you do. And the other one was that your relationships at home are much more likely to be successful when you have a community that's supportive of your relationships. So you wanna have a really miserable time trying to do stuff, you wanna get old quickly, have a really bad marriage. 
Okay, <laughs> that is like the fastest way to get old, <laughs> okay? So let's talk about that. Well, you need to work on your marriage if you have a bad marriage, but being in a community that isn't it's supportive true, it's of really marriage, bad for your mitochondria. Yeah, exactly, your mitochondria like, kill me now, <laughs> right? Uh, so the power of, of, of the people around you, even to keep your personal relationship intact, was very strong, and it came through. That was work from Esther Perel that's reflected in here. Um, some of the other ones, um, the one that I think is one of my most favorite has to do with um, being smarter. And I was on Nightline at the very beginning of Bulletproof because I was the only guy willing to go on national news and say, I've been on modafinil, the limitless drug, for eight years, and it changed my life, it changed my meditation, I got my MBA, uh, I started my company using a prescription smart drug. And I'm completely happy, and as a matter of fact, you are suffering from a deficiency of the smart drug, which was totally an in-your-face statement and not really true, but it sure got people riled up. And the point here was that cognitive enhancement is real, it is here to stay, and I've put aniracetam and paracetam, which are anti-aging drugs and have been for 50 plus years made by Sandoz Pharmaceuticals but are not in the physician's desk reference in the US, what the hell. Uh, anyhow, I've been on those things for 20 years. I don't take modafinil on a regular basis, I don't need to because my, my mitochondria work well and I've done neurofeedback on my brain and like, things are dialed in pretty good. I do, by the way. <laughs> uh, you take it? Uh-huh. Oh, I love this stuff, right? It, in fact, I, I, took it, I took it just when I was writing the modafinil chapter, I'm like, I, I reread the science. Right. I'm like, oh my God, I have to take some. So I took some. And You just valid, I've been on it for years as well, but you validated it two years oh, yeah. ago. I was like, oh yeah. It's, it's a real drug. Right. But how many people listening have not heard of modafinil or provigil? Most of them. How many of them know of Adderall, which is way less of a safe drug? And also, if you're going to have to be on stage after jet lag, you're driving at night and you don't want to die, coffee only works for so long. Okay, I sell coffee for a living, really good coffee, but I can tell you, if it's four in the morning and you've already had enough coffee, another cup of coffee will not keep you from driving off the road. Modafinil will and it won't make you want to shoot people the way Adderall does. Okay, it's a Well, good, it depends who it is. But. That's a fair point, <laughs> unless they deserve it. But it, it's a good drug, right? right? Why can't we have adult discussions about smart drugs? In the US, we go, oh, that's cheating. And you say, I'm gonna take this other drug that makes me live twice as long. Oh, that's cheating. Here's the deal. You go back in time, like a million, actually 2.4 million years. We just found evidence of some sort of hominid using tools 2.4 million years ago. So apparently we've been working on getting where we are for a while. So 2.4 million years ago, there's these two cavemen, and one of them comes in and says, look, I found fire after the lightning. I'm gonna use it to stay warm this winter. And the other one said, that's cheating. Well, one of those two is our ancestor. Okay. The other one died, right? We use tools. We use tools to be smarter. Is it on your 23andMe report? It, it is, okay. actually, yeah. It, okay, I gotta tell you this. <laughs> I am one of the blessed people who have the Neanderthal gene for less back oh. hair. Oh, well, congratulations. I have less back hair. <laughs> <laughs> Lana Sorry. must be so happy about that. <laughs> it's, it's been a big factor in our relationship. I'm I have sure. a whole community of people with less back hair. Well, you need a community. <laughs> <laughs> but like th this sort of thing about smart drugs, we, we are wired to use technology. And this is just one of those. And some of them have great downside, but many of them have great upside and not much, if any, downside. If you're willing to take ibuprofen, you should be willing to consider modafinil, right? And let's just lay it out there the way it is. So I put it out there, the people who are, who are doing big things, they've mostly, I don't know if I can say mostly, I, I believe without having strong data, an abnormally large percentage of people who have done really big things have at least once or twice used psychedelic drugs. Uh, and I've asked a bunch of people that. Wow. We finally had people come out of the closet. I did ayahuasca 20 something years ago. Steve Jobs talks about it, Larry and Sergey talk about it. And I went to a dinner, and I write about this in, in, um, in Game Changers. I went to dinner in New York with movers and shakers across New York, and we did a, a dinner uh, where it was a Jeffersonian dialogue, and you could actually have one person ask everyone at the table a question, and, it, and only one person spoke at a time. It was, it was very different than everyone talking. And I said when it was my turn, hey, how many of you have used, there's 25 people at the table, 70-year-old hedge fund managers, 25-year-old artists, whatever, how many of you have used psychedelic drugs for personal development? at least once. Every single hand in the room goes up. People you would never expect. So this oh, is happening. Oh, we need to talk about that when we get off camera. <laughs> I mean, you want to raise nerve growth factor, right. BDNF, wow. all those things. It totally makes a difference. And if you go to Disneyland on LSD, you're stupid. That's not what it's for, and they are not without risk. So in Game Changers, I talk about that very openly. I talk about my experiences. 
and I talk about what you can do that isn't drugs and why it's a bad idea to do this before your prefrontal cortex is formed at 24. This is not kids play, this is not recreational, this is intentional use. Even ketamine with a licensed physician works exceptionally well for trauma reduction. So you can go in in a ketamine clinic today, get shot up here, and have less PTSD. You wanna age real quickly? Have PTSD. So use pharmaceuticals. So I'm just calling it out the way it is in Game Changers. I, I believe there's great value in that chapter. So of your Game Changers that mm -hmm. you've, you've profiled in here, obviously, as I said earlier, they are all mentors of yours. And you are a men you've become a mentor to so many, but who do you, who do you, who's that first phone call when you have a question? Other than your wife. Uh, well, yeah, my wife's an ER doctor. Uh, we, we met 14 years ago at the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine, so it's kind of cool we get to come here so for an anniversary. So you got your doctor and your wife all on yeah. the trip. Uh, but it depends on, you know, what I'm working on, right? It's sort of like if, if your car is broken, you're going to call the mechanic, and if, you know, something in your house is not is blinking when it shouldn't, you're going to call the electrician, right? Um, so I'm, I'm very fortunate. I've, I've had hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of stem cells over the last five years. Um, maybe some of the most extensive stem cell work done uh, in one sitting ever. Uh, so if it's stem cell related, I have a few people I'm going to call, uh, all of whom are in here, by the way. Uh, and if I'm looking at you know, mitochondrial stuff, it might be another thing. And I mean, I had a question about uh, my vagus nerve. So I'm like, I think uh, Stephen Porges, the founder of polyvagal theory, I'll just drop him a note. Like, oh my God, how cool that is. I can ask like the best people on earth. By the way, that was a, f a profound interview on Bulletproof Radio uh, with Stephen. And some of those are very popular. But it, it's one of those things where I get to reach out to people like this. And, and if my business is, is like, like, I don't know how to do this. It's weird. I'll call up Naveen Jain, who's doing Viome. And he'll say, oh, Dave, let me tell you, I did this in one of my seven companies that have changed the world, and this happened three companies ago, and you just need to do this. I'm like, oh, thank God. He so, needs to write a parenting handbook, by the oh, way. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he, Naveen's a, a, a very unusual human. Or I can call Peter Diamandis, right. right? The guy who started the X Prize that led to the private travel boom of space that we're experiencing right now. So I'm, I am just profoundly lucky, but what I want to do is distill all of that knowledge into principles. That's why I wrote Game Changers. And I'm sitting here matters. thinking, you know, I probably should write a book because I've had you on the program now the second time. Mm -hmm. I had Peter Diamandis in oh, yeah? <laughs> cool. I've had Naveen here the other day. Mm -hmm. So I've had just as many game changers on this podcast. Well, statistically anyway, or percentage wise mm -hmm. as you have. So, but I have not even 1% of your viewership. So we need to do something about that. Well, I'm, <laughs> well, I'm doing my best to help you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and it, it's one of those things where uh, podcasts are are, are increasingly coming out, and you do a fantastic job. And there are a lot of people who, who haven't You're done the work. Well, well, they haven't learned how to interview, right. right? Or they haven't learned how to do production quality. And, and I know because, well, I have a show, and you can tell when someone pays attention. So we've got mics above my head. You probably can't see. We're both wearing lav mics. You've got a team of two guys here. You've got two cameras. Okay, you dialed in, and it's because, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this on the air, it's, but it's because you give a shit, right? <laughs> And do. yeah, and a lot of times, people are like, I just got to get, I got to do a podcast that's going to make me rich. And I, this is advice for the physicians or something uh, who might be listening. You want to do a podcast? How much work is a podcast? You tell me. Oh my God. It, is, we, huge, it is huge. It is huge. Okay. So, <laughs> it is, even yeah. the people I work with at A4M, they have no idea what, I do, what, what yeah. it takes. I added up the hours when I was writing Game Changers. Right. I'm like, between prep time and reading a book and all that stuff, I get at least eight hours to make an episode of Bulletproof Radio. 500 episodes times eight hours. Let's see, uh, eight times 500, that's two full years of working 40 hours a week. Okay, that's a big commitment, but, and you also see no reward for months, and I'm guessing it took a while to get your viewership up to where it is now? Yeah. Yeah, so it's a thankless task, and you just turn and turn and turn, and you get a bunch of people making podcasts that are only gonna have 10 episodes because it gets boring, unless you really care, and you really do a good job, and you just keep doing it. So I think you've already met that bar, which is fantastic. Well, thank you. But it's Coming hard. from you, that means a lot. Oh, you're welcome. Just so I would just say, if, if you think starting a podcast is an instant way to get people to your clinic, it's gonna suck your clinic time <laughs> to do it right. It just is, right. am I right? Right, <laughs> risk reward. So, okay, so your parents, you're, you, you do some of your biohacking on every now and then. I see you posting. Oh yeah. So, uh, what do they think of what you're doing? Uh, they are uh, they're supportive of it, and they actually do it. They have bullet coffee every morning, 
they practice intermittent fasting on a regular basis. Amazing. There's a hyperbaric chamber in their, uh, in their living room. And in fact, my dad says he thinks it saved his life. Wow. And they have the, the true light, uh, infrared lights, and they have the true dark glasses, and they read all my books, and they take all the bulletproof supplements. Uh, and it affects their brains. I think they're, they're happier, they're nicer. I bought them stem cells for their birthday. So they, they've had actually a couple stem cell treatments now. And I think my mom avoided knee replacement that way. So they're, they're reaping the benefits of having uh, a son who knows a thing or two about biohacking. I know you have to run, so I want, I want to ask you one last question. So your kindergarten teacher, mm -hmm. if I were to ask her, or he, uh, I'm assuming it was a female. I don't know why I'm assuming uh -huh. this, but okay. Do you remember your kindergarten teacher? Oh, my kindergarten teacher? Yeah. Oh, I was thinking my kid's kindergarten no, teacher. No, yours. Think back. Kindergarten, first grade. You were, you know, five, six years old. Yeah, I, uh, I remember that. Okay. Uh -huh. What would they say about you today um, compared to how you were at that time? They probably wouldn't recognize me. So you got to remember, I lived in a basement with toxic mold. Mm -hmm. So I had ADD, I had ODD, oppositional defiant disorder. My, like that file they keep at the principal's office, it was this thick. And I'd get in fights all the time. And that time. was just by first grade, right? <laughs> uh, of course. And the principals kept retiring when I'd finish. I'd burn them out. I mean, I, I, was, I was a pretty, I was bright, clearly, when I was young. I was also bored and angry and toxic. So, ugh, not, not a good combination. So, uh, sorry <laughs> to all of my teachers. But uh, I like to think I'm better now. And they're drinking your coffee. They probably if are. If they're still alive. Yeah, I hope they are. Right. Except for that one. Just <laughs> <laughs> totally teasing. <laughs> okay, wait a second. I have another question for you. So what technologies that are coming down are you really excited about? Whether or not something you're involved with or, or something sure. else out there. Well, one of the things that does not get its due is ozone therapy. And ozone therapy is, it, it doesn't require drugs. It's dirt cheap. Uh, it's easy to do at home. It's easy for doctors to do intravenously. The risks are, are relatively low. I did ozone therapy at home to cure my mold and Lyme disease when I was at its worst. And I've seen people, including people we both know who've been exposed to mold, who, look, you need to go do this. I know it's off the, off the reservation. Ozone therapy is a technology for mitochondrial resuscitation. Is It's going to explode over the next couple of years because you do that in combination with ketosis, combination with hyperbarics and things like that. And you realize, wow, you can really turn on mitochondrial function and get rid of diseases that are not supposed to be possible to get rid of. So I've had uh, Robert Rowan on Bulletproof Radio, who's definitely a maverick. And last time there was Ebola in Africa, he flew out there and treated Ebola and got it to go away with ozone and talked about it on the radio. Meanwhile, they're doing vaccines and all these big drugs and all this. This is a treatment that costs a nickel. You are such a game changer. And Thank the you. book is Game Changers. You have to get it right now. It'll change your life, both physically, emotionally, professionally, personally. Thank you. Well, thank you for your time, Dave, and please come back again. Of course.